excited to get into the Word of God tonight. Amen. Are you guys excited with me? It will happen, I promise you. Uh, if you will turn to Hebrews chapter 7 with me. Uh, Pastor Brian asked uh, me to teach tonight. He gave me the okay to have all the students in here. That's why it's a little crammed. But you know what? It may, it's, you know, this is my peeps. You know what I mean? Rise high. I always say that we're a family, you know? And, and what's amazing is what I love about this is these students get to understand the greater family that is the church. Amen? And, and that's why I'm thankful to get the chance to share. And so um, Pastor Brian was like, hey, teach wherever you want to teach. I was like, all right, let's go. So I, I just started searching, and the Lord really put something on my heart. And so as you're turning to Hebrews chapter 7, I know the, the verses here say 22 to 25. That's going to be our main section, but I'm going to start in 17. And so uh, go ahead and bow your heads with me. If you're turning, you can turn, but I'm going to pray real quick. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, I thank you for tonight. Um, Lord, I don't take the opportunity to share your word um, lightly, Lord, but um, Lord, I, I desire to just enter into your presence. And so, Lord, I just ask and pray that you would uh, use me as your vessel. Lord, I want to be an instrument. I want you to be the one who receives all the glory. And I want my brothers and sisters tonight to find encouragement. Um, and so, Jesus, I just ask that you would speak. I ask that you would move, and Jesus, use me. Lord, be our intercessor tonight as we know you are, and just usher us into your presence. I ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. Okay, when I said I promise that we are going to get in the Word, it's because with my youth group background, I thought it'd be cool to play a little game first, if that's cool with you guys. This game requires nothing else but you stand and sit, okay? I made it easy on you. I, I sometimes bring marshmallows and eggs to church, but I, I took it easy. So if everyone doesn't mind standing really quick, just right where you're at, this game is basically called Sit Down If, okay? And just, to, just in case you need some incentive, uh, I do have Eden, one of our faithful student leader servant back there in the back. Let's hear it for Eden. Uh, she has two in and out gift cards for the two winners. So if just in case you're like, you really get the youth group feel, this is simply put, I'm going to name some different events or things. And if you have not done this, you take a seat. Simple enough? Okay, don't feel, you know, you, we may learn some things about each other today. It's going to be really good. This is the church. I'm going to ask all the dirty lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, we're going to start. So if you haven't done this, sit, okay? Sit down if you have not broken a bone. If you, are the, if you have been sheltered and safe your whole life, if you have not broken a bone, sit down. If you, have, you are a bubble boy or a bubble girl, I'm just kidding. Okay, all right, all right. And I understand fractures and all that stuff. I'm talking, bam, it snapped, okay? All right, so we got broken bones in the room. Cool, 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 cool. Let's see how this works out. All right, next thing's next. Sit down if you have never been to a live concert. If you've never been to a live concert, you haven't got your Phil Wickham on or seen the sticks or something like that. I don't know, I'm trying to get a wide range. Okay, all right, we got music lovers in the room, let's go. I will get you guys, I promise. Sit down if you've never been thrown a surprise party. You've never been thrown a surprise party. If you have been thrown a surprise party, stay standing, wow. You guys are loved, you guys are so loved. Sorry, just kidding, you're also all loved. Okay, there's a lot of people and I only have two gift cards, this is gonna be rough. Sit down if you have never served at a vacation Bible school. If you have never served at a vacation Bible school, take a seat. You don't get to stand back up if you have. Eden, you were just sitting. That's not... She's up. Okay. No cheating in this room. Okay. Wow. Praise God. This is amazing. Okay. Sit down if... This is going to get funny. This may get a lot of people. This is what I was hoping for. Sit down if... You have never eaten a bug. If you've never eaten a bug in your life, this man right here is eating a lot of bugs. I know that for a fact. Now we're revealing things about ourselves. I would be standing too because I have definitely eaten some gas station crickets in my life. If y'all have had the gas station crickets, it's another level. Okay, I gotta get this. I'm gonna fail right now. Sit down if... You've never traveled to another country. Traveled to another country. To another country. Wow, okay. You guys have, come on, let's go. All right, this is the last one I have, so we're going to see how this plays out. 
Uh, sit down if you've never learned to play an instrument. Learn to play an instrument. And I mean proficiently. James is so saying, can you play an instrument proficiently, James? <laughs> Take a seat. Take a seat. Okay. I got four. Dang, dude, I should have got four gift cards right now. All right, here's what's going to happen. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. And there is no best two out of three. You just play it. Ready? Pay attention. I'll say it. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Do, you, do we got, do we understand? I got five. Where's my fifth? Oh, my gosh, guys. We're just all going to have to fight. Okay, here's how we're doing this because I need to teach the word of God. If you're standing right now, meet me afterwards. We're playing rock, paper, scissors for the rewards. Give them a round of applause. You got to be flexible. You never know how this is going to go. I've thought for sure eating the bug would have had a lot of people down, but y'all are weird. Okay, we are in Hebrews chapter 7 tonight. And my heart, and I promise you, the kids don't believe me, I promise you this will be quick, but... I would like to encourage us in a doctrine, and if you guys, the, the understanding of a doctrine is a teaching that I believe many Christians overlook, or, or at least just don't acknowledge in their day-to-day -day walk with Christ. The only reason I'm saying this is not because I have some like uh, special relationship with Jesus. Now, I've been reading a book very slowly, because that's how I read books, uh, and the book's called Gentle and Lowly. It's by a pastor named Dave, uh, or Dane Ortland. Uh, if anybody's read it, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and Mr. Ortland's heart behind the book is, is not to just explore certain attributes of our God because there's many attributes and you can explore them deeply. But it, he, he describes that he's, he's wanting to describe the heart of God, to literally describe the heart of God. Jesus says in Matthew 11, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And he says who God is is what he does, Right? And, and the book just does an incredible job of exploring. It doesn't, it doesn't like uh, cheapen the, the justice of God or the wrath of God. It doesn't, it just explores the heart of God in Christ. And there's one chapter that I just recently read that talks about Jesus being our intercessor. Now, the idea, just moving forward, because I'm going to say this term a lot, the idea of interceding is, is standing in the gap. Is someone standing in between uh, another two people, Right? And we're going to explore this more. I'm not going to give it all the way ahead of time, but I believe Hebrews chapter 7, verses 17 through 25, explores this, this doctrine a lot. And so follow along with me. I'm going to read quickly. Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 17, says, For it is witnessed of him, speaking of Jesus, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, Speaking of the law, verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced. And when you think of introduced, think of like two people, you've been introduced to a person. A better hope has been introduced, though uh, through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who were formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath. By the one who said to him, speaking of God the Father, <laughs> The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Verse 22, this is the main meat of our section. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. They're humans. They're going to die. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Verse 25 shares the heart of it all. Consequently, because of everything that's been said, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, I never like, I tell the students all the time, I never like to pick up in a book, especially one like Hebrews that's so theologically rich. I never like to just be like, yeah, boom, here's my thoughts. So to give some context, up until this point, the writer of Hebrews, who we don't know who it is, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we know who it is. It, he, up, to the, up to this point, is making the point that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than every, every heavenly host and angel that has come before. There's been many messengers who brought messages of God. Jesus is greater than them. He's a, the writer has the audacity to say in chapter 3, Jesus is greater than Moses. 
who's a patriarch of the Jews, who's the one who brought the law. And, and he, the writer makes this point that Jesus is greater than Moses. He built the house. And then up to this point in, in the book, or about in the middle of it, he makes the point that Jesus is the great high priest, greater than the, the Levitical priesthood of old instituted by Moses and Aaron, where men and women had to come and bring sacrifices, and they, they, they approached Mount, Mount Sinai with fear. They approached the tabernacle. They couldn't go beyond the veil. Only the priests could go, that his priesthood is greater. And we know this because verse 17 The writer quotes from Psalm 110, verse four, and he says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, who is this Melchizedek? I'll tell you right now, in 2024, that's not gonna be your top baby names uh, for boys and girls. It might be on mine, you know what I mean? I like, you know, little Kezi or something like that. Um, But no, in all seriousness, in, in Genesis 14, we get introduced, Abram, he's not even Abraham yet, is, is taking this journey of faith. God has said, I'm gonna take you to a land that you don't know. And he goes, bet, let's, let's go. I'm headed there, right? And, and so he starts going. And on this journey, he comes across this king of Salem. And king of Salem is translated king of peace. So there's this king who blesses him. And it, it, scripture also tells us that he's a, he's a priest of God, which if you guys don't understand, like within the chronology of the Bible, the priesthood hasn't even started yet like the Levitical priesthood has not And so Melchizedek's just this figure. M- many scholars, myself included, think this, this might be a, a, I'm not a scholar. That sounded really arrogant. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm just a youth guy. Um, they believe this is a Christophany. It's, it's, a, it's an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. There's solid arguments against that. Really, it doesn't matter. The idea is, the idea is that this king of Salem, this Melchizedek, this is the priesthood that Jesus comes from. And we know that the writer of Hebrews even says Melchizedek was without lineage, like there was no family line you could follow. So interesting. But the idea is this. Jesus is given the title of priest from a better priesthood. One sworn by the Father by his own word. When the Father speaks, creation happens. When the Father speaks, it is done. And this is them saying in this psalm that the Father says, you are. Messiah, you, my son, will be a priest forever. It will not end. And here's why this is powerful. Because no longer do you need me to enter into God's presence. No longer do you need your Bible study partners. Praise God for them. No longer do you need a priest on this planet or a pastor on this planet to usher you into the presence of God. We have a priest forever, amen? Amen. And his priesthood is not of bloodline, or lineage, though Jesus has the lineage, but it's because the Father has said, you are priests forever. It's why in Hebrews chapter four, the writer of Hebrews could say, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. For those of you right now who need to hear the word, you can approach the throne of grace because your high priest says, come in with confidence this is what this message is tonight for you. You who, who approach the throne of grace not with confidence, that needs to change tonight. I want us to focus in on verse 22 where it says, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. The word guarantor or egios, egenos, I'm really bad at Greek, so forgive me. I did not take that in Bible college. Um, that word speaks of surety or check this out. I promise you I didn't plan this. Surety or a sponsor. <laughs> the Lord knows what he's doing. Our church every year, and I'm just saying this just to give an idea, our church every year sponsors dozens of kids to go to camp. I have never once had to do, in my four and a half years here, ever had to do a bake sale. I've never had to like make nachos. We've never had to wash cars. Because our church every year, when we come and say, kids need to go to camp, they respond. And they sponsor so that I could be a messenger coming and telling students, you are guaranteed to go to camp. Guaranteed. You don't need to worry about it. That is what the scriptures are saying about Jesus. The price he paid and this new covenant of grace says you approach God and you can guarantee that you're in his presence. You can guarantee you have grace. You you messed up yesterday, you can guarantee in the name of Jesus that you walk into a better covenant 
And you can say, yes and amen, Lord. You hear me. Not because of what we do. We don't have enough. We can't do it. You see, the last, the last covenant was a covenant that was weak and useless, and, and not because the law is useless, okay? Not because the law isn't important. The law shows us we're sinners, correct? But Romans chapter 7 makes it clear it's our sin, it's our sin that makes the old covenant useless. Because in our sin, the law condemns. Because as I try to reach like every other religion in humanity, and this is not a knock, but every other merit-based religion, reaching for the God on the mountain. The law tells them, you don't got enough provisions, you don't even got legs to stand on. But this new covenant says, Christ has done it for you. Christ has guaranteed in his blood that you have a covenant of grace, that you have a right standing with God because of grace. And this covenant is a covenant that is sure forever because your priest lives forever. Now, I'm going to really focus in. I'm going to land this plan, land on this last verse here. Verse 25 basically culminates everything we just talked about. We know that Jesus is this, he is this great high priest. He comes from, he's, he's built different. Like he's from a whole different line and, and, and he, doesn't, he doesn't have to worry about dying. We don't need a new priest. We have one forever. Consequently, verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. And Listen to this last section. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives. Here's the heart of the doctrine of intercession. There is one standing in between you and me and the Father. And his name is Jesus. Because Jesus is a priest forever. Because by an oath and a word of the Father, helpful to remember, the Father's not like upset at us. He's the one who sent the Son, correct? So he made the way. Because God has made him this, he's able to take every unrighteous sinner and make them right. He can save to the uttermost. And if this might confuse you, it was, it was really encouraging to understand that statement, save to the uttermost. The idea here is that Jesus is able to save fully. And let me explain that. This isn't speaking of universalism. Not every person on this planet will be saved. Because there will be those who will reject the great high priest, who will reject the invitation of the gospel. But know this, every person who comes by faith, they are saved fully, completely. Jesus saves to the uttermost. There's no part of it, there's no partial sons and daughters, okay? There's no partial saved Christians, but I think some of us walk that way right? I know it because I've experienced it myself. Lord, this week, I just don't feel like I'm near you. I don't feel like I can approach you. Has anybody ever said that to their child? If you have, still walk in grace today. No, when my kids come, I fail at times. My son can be a little emotional. And sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm like, just quit it. But he can know. He, he can come to me. And that's the reality of what this is saying here, is he can save to the uttermost. You are his child, like, we just need to hear that when we are his, we are fully his, even when we struggle to see it. But it doesn't stop there. He continues in that last statement to say, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I'm going to say one more time. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. We really need to hear this because it's powerful. And it literally destroys every lie that the enemy tells. Like you need to hear that the son of God exists in heaven alive today, constantly interceding on your behalf. You personally. And that's not some like American individualism. That's that's just the truth of scripture. He, He prays for you. He says this, even when we fail, Jesus, the Jesus who died on the cross and rose again by the power of the Spirit, always, meaning at all times, lives actively and powerfully with the same power that created everything to make intercession or to stand between the Father and us. And too often, we treat Jesus as past tense. And here's what I mean by that. 
he's justified me. He's forgiven me. He's done all this for me. Now I need to finish this race on my own, right? Now I need to tie my bootstraps up and be a good Christian. And hear me when I say this. Don't misunderstand. Obedience and faith with works are important. So don't think I'm, I'm sitting here preaching some like loosey-goosey, like Jesus will love you even if you don't follow him. Like, no, obedience shows our love for him, correct? John 15, Jesus says, if you, if you love me, you'll, you'll obey my commandments. He's not saying you're saved if you obey my commandments. He's saying you will show others you love me as you follow me. But we change that into I'm gonna finish this race by just trying to do better and then when I fail, I'll try to do a little bit more better. Nothing ever changed in his mind. You see, here's the reality. It is Christ who will finish the work he started in you. Philippians chapter one, verse six says. It is Christ who works in you and me both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You ever notice that? It said it is Christ who works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's not, it's me who works in me, right? And check this out. That was Philippians 2.13, by the way. This next one, it, it is Christ who remains faithful even when we're faithless. 2 Timothy 2.13. Like these are verses we just need to understand as we follow him. What I desire for us to leave with today, I'm landing the plane, I promise this, is that we have a savior, but we also have an intercessor. And I think that needs to start to becoming a part of our language and our faith, is we do have a savior but we have an intercessor who stands in the gap for us, who does like this cool little image Cheryl Angel made for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? That gap there, you can't make it. I can't make it. Like too often I struggle with my sin. I, I fail to be who, exactly who Christ is calling me to be, right? But like he, he closed the gap. And this is what we need to hear right now. We have a friend in our corner when we fail. You guys ever need a friend when you fail? We have an advocate in our trial when we're clearly guilty, standing in our defense. We have a father, and some of us need to hear this, a father who holds our hands and guides us when we stumble and protects us from all accusers. I fail sometimes to protect my son, but the father never fails at that. He protects you from the enemy. When the enemy fires lies, he goes, that's my, that's my daughter, that's my son. We have a priest who opens the veil continuously and says, come in. Anytime and every time, even when you're feeling guilty. I want to end with, with two quotes from the book that I just thought were, and this book is wrecking me. That's obviously why I'm so excited. Dane Ortland writes in, the, in that same chapter, Inter- intercession by Christ is the constant hitting refresh of our justification in the courts of heaven. Jesus' intercession is the moment you fail, him before the Father going, that's my son, that's my daughter, refresh. They're justified. That's what the intercession is. And yes, you still need to. It's, It's important for us to still come and bring confession to the Lord, right? It's still important for us to be heartbroken and repent. Don't think I'm giving you excuses not to do that anymore. But that, again, shows our love but Christ is doing that daily and he doesn't fall asleep, right? And he doesn't get tired and he doesn't have bad days where you don't feel like repenting. He constantly lives to intercede. And listen to this last one, this last quote by Dane Ortland: Jesus, Jesus' saving power always outpaces our, and overwhelms our sinning. Jesus' saving always outpaces and overwhelms our sinning. You may feel like you're in the worst spot you've been in your faith. I guarantee you, Jesus' saving love outpaces it by a mile. Where sin abounds, grace abounds the much more. Amen? Amen. And I want to end for us with this this encouragement out of the book of Hebrews, because I'm just like, I'm in on Hebrews right now. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, there's a portion where, where the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He says, you run the race with endurance, looking to who? You say it, who are we looking to? Jesus. 
Don't look to yourself. Don't look to your favorite pastor. No hate on them. No hate on you. They're not the ones that are going to get you to the end. Jesus is the author. He started it, and he is the perfecter. He'll finish it. But if we can't look to Jesus, and we start to look horizontal or in the mirror at ourselves, it, it's going to seem like we can't get there. But I want to promise you, brothers and sisters in Christ tonight, you have an intercessor who's not only in your corner, but he stands in heaven in your defense. And we can, we can walk in power. We can walk as if we know we're in the kingdom of God every day if we believe that. Amen? Let me pray for you guys real quick. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that some of us in this room, Lord, some of us have been walking for a long time, and I'm sitting here, a 29-year-old, bringing this encouragement, and they're like, you don't know the things I've seen, and, and I probably don't. But Lord Jesus, I know you do. And I know, Lord, I know because I, I'm acquainted with my own sin. I see it. Lord, but there's nothing in scripture that makes me think or know that I'm supposed to carry myself to the end. Lord Jesus, so many of us walk and we think you turn your nose down at us, that you turn your face from us. The only person who experienced God turning his face is you on that cross so that we don't have to. Lord, I pray right now that the enemy would be weakened by the faith that walks out of this room, knowing that in Jesus we have an intercessor, knowing that in Jesus we have exactly what we need to carry forward, he who can keep us from stumbling, he who can give us a way out, he who can do greater works in us than we could have ever imagined, he who can give us boldness, he who can help us to fight the sins and temptations that we fall into. You've been here the whole time, Jesus. And you're not turning your nose down. And you're not turning from us. Lord, I pray right now as we just end with this song that we would just embrace our Jesus tonight. That we would look to you and recognize that we have such hope in our living hope. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you that you've called each one of us. And Lord, for my brothers and sisters who haven't experienced the love of Christ, who haven't bent that knee, who haven't repented of their sin and said, I need help getting to the end. I pray that they would confess your name tonight, Jesus. Your word says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that you rose from the dead. We are saved. We are saved to the uttermost. Do that tonight, Lord Jesus, in our hearts. We pray this in your name. Amen.